Hi everyone, welcome back. In this mini lecture, we're going to talk about crystal lattices. So let's just pause for a little bit and remember where we are in the big scheme of condensed matter physics. In the last mini lectures, we talked about the properties of the free electron gas when we allow T greater than zero. We talked about the density of states. We talked about the Sommerfeld expansion. And we talked about specific heat in the Sommerfeld model. Remember, we found that it is linearly proportional to the temperature T. Now, this is in direct contrast to our earlier calculation in the framework of the Druda model, where we predicted no temperature dependence of the specific heat. In the Sommerfeld model, remember that we include Fermi-Dirac statistics, and this led us to a prediction that a specific heat should depend linearly on the temperature. This is in fact something that is experimentally observed, uh, especially at low temperatures where other mechanisms that contribute to the specific heat, like phonons, freeze out. Indeed, one can see a linear T dependence of the specific heat. Um, though again, as I just mentioned, at higher temperatures, this fails. Often one will see a term proportional to T cubed. So this is an indication that even though the Sommerfeld model makes some important improvements, over the Druda model, it's not quite correct. Um, other things that differ in experiment than theory include things like conductivities, which actually do depend on temperature. Uh, the Hall coefficients and magnetoresistance actually depend on magnetic fields. Remember in the Druda model, we predict that they do not. The Wiedemann-Franz law does not hold in all temperature ranges for metals. Uh, but perhaps the most pressing question, though we're left with after studying the Judah model, is we still don't know why some materials are metals and why some aren't. This is a major question that we're left with, and the Judah model simply has nothing to say. So now we're going to begin a major section of the course uh, where we'll begin to answer this question. So to get started, let's remember the basic assumptions of the Judah model. Remember, the first assumption is that electrons are classical. We just began to relax that assumption when we considered the Sommerfeld model. The second assumption of the Druda model is that the electrons collide with ions. The next one is that the electrons are free. Remember, that means they don't interact with the ions except during these collisions. The next one is that the electrons are independent. And the last assumption is that they reach thermal equilibrium via collisions. Now, as I just mentioned, we already took steps to relax assumption zero. Uh, this was what led us to include Fermi-Dirac statistics uh, 
uh, in the Judah model and what led us to Sommerfeld theory. Uh, now we're going to start uh, relaxing uh, assumptions one and actually two. These are, are both related. Um, so there are some sub assumptions that we've made or some sort of sub questions that one has when one thinks about these two assumptions. Uh, so the first sub assumption or question really is, we have assumed that the ions have no effect on the electrons between collisions. If you like, that's a restatement of the free electron assumption. The second sort of sub-assumption or sub-question here is um, we don't really understand how do the ions cause collisions themselves. We have to assume that there's some mechanism for this, but we don't yet know what it is. And we have also assumed that the ions themselves are not dynamical. So sub-assumptions or questions two and three We'll come back again when we talk about phonons, mechanical vibrations of the lattice. Um, we're going to start attacking subassumption one here. Uh, we're going to embark on a long journey uh, in which we'll relax the assumption that the electrons uh, uh, don't experience the ions except during these collisions, and we'll see that this leads to a vast and tremendous wealth of interesting new physics. So we're going to concentrate on, again, the sub-assumption number one. And the, the general um, assumption we're going to make to make some headway in solving this is that, yes, the electrons interact with the electrostatic potential of the ions, um, but we're going to assume that it's a periodic potential. And the fact that this potential is periodic is really the main reason that we can make uh, any headway. And you'll see that it allows us to make uh, a significant amount of headway in attacking this problem. So um, let's start talking about periodic potentials here. Uh, this is going to lead us to our discussion of uh, crystal lattices. Um, so let's start this discussion by just thinking and noticing about the world around us that many elements that are solid naturally appear uh, in crystalline form. Now, what do we mean by a crystal? We mean that a crystal is some arrangement of atoms that repeats apparently indefinitely. So one wants to think of things like uh, diamond, uh, 
uh, or, or graphite. These are both crystalline structures. Interestingly, they're different uh, crystal structures of the same uh, atomic species. This is something we'll talk about later. Um, so a crystal is some arrangement of atoms that repeats apparently indefinitely. Uh, you might ask, um, why is it true that most or, or uh, perhaps even all solids appear uh, in crystalline form under some conditions? Um, there is actually no general proof of this, um, though it sounds plausible because uh, you can imagine that if a solid is composed of many atoms of the same kind, um, if each uh, uh, atom has the same lowest energy configuration, the same lowest energy uh, configuration of its nearest neighbors that it would like to experience, um, and that that lowest energy configuration is the same for all atoms, then it's maybe not so hard to imagine that uh, one would end up with a periodic structure. So again, there's no general proof of this, but at least on some level, it sounds um, uh, plausible. So let's continue to make this definition uh, more precise. So a crystal is some arrangement of atoms that repeats apparently indefinitely. Or we can say the crystal is an arrangement of atoms on the lattice. And we'll say that a lattice is an arrangement of points that repeats indefinitely. Okay, so the simplest type of lattice is called a brevet lattice. So what is a brevet lattice? Well, we can give two equivalent definitions. First, you could say that a brevet lattice is an infinite set of points Uh, with an arrangement and orientation that looks the same from whichever point in the array uh, one is viewing the array from. So it's a set of points that looks the same uh, no matter what point uh, you're standing on and looking at the rest of the array from. Uh, another definition of a brevet lattice is uh, a set of points with positions of the form capital R is equal to N1 A1 plus N2 A2 plus N3 A3. Let me draw a better R here. Where A1, A2, and A3 are any three vectors not in the same plane and the ni are integers. So we'll call the ai uh, primitive lattice vectors. <clears throat> 
Good. So as an example, let's consider the oblique lattice. So this is a two-dimensional lattice that looks something like this. It's a brevet lattice. You can convince yourself of this by positioning yourself in an imaginary world on any of these lattice points, and you can see that your neighborhood uh, looks the same from uh, whichever lattice point you decide to, to occupy. Um, we can also define a set of primitive lattice vectors. So let's pick an A1 that looks like this and an A2 that looks like this. Let me add another set of points here. Uh, let's define one point here, an, an O point over here, a P point here, and a Q point here. Okay, you can see that I can go from O to P uh, by going over three units of, of A2. I can go from O to Q by going over two units of A2 and one of A1. Right, um, my choice of primitive vectors is not unique. I'm free to define, let's say, an A3 over here. So I can define a set of primitive vectors A2 and A3, or A1 and A3. For example, if I pick only A2 and A3, I can go from O to Q by moving over uh, one multiple, two multiples of A2 rather, and uh, uh, nope. Uh, one, one multiple of A2 and one, one of uh, A, A3, all right? Um, good. Um, let's talk about the honeycomb lattice. So this is, for example, how the carbon atoms in graphene are arranged. There's a hexagonal pattern of carbon atoms. Let me just draw lines between them. Now ask yourself, is this honeycomb lattice, a brevet lattice? Think about it for a second. The answer is no. How can you see that? Well, the easiest way to see that is by realizing that the neighborhood of points around any given point depends on whichever point you stand on. For example, if I stand on this point here, I have these three neighbors. But if I stand on this point here, I have a set of neighbors in a different orientation. So the honeycomb lattice uh, is in fact not uh, a brevet lattice. And this is something that we'll come back to later on in the course. This fact is actually something that underlies some of the interesting physics uh, in graphene. Now, even though we can't think about the honeycomb lattice as a brevet lattice in and of itself, we can think of it as a lattice with a basis. So an easy way to motivate this discussion is to realize that not all crystals uh, are composed of the same type of atom. Uh, in some cases, you can imagine a crystal as consisting of a lattice with two different types of atoms uh, per lattice point. So we can talk about a lattice with a basis. This is the case where you have more than one um, crystal point per lattice point. So if we think about the oblique lattice, we drew before, I can think about a lattice with a basis if I imagine decorating two crystal points on each lattice point. So if I think about this distance as A, uh, I will say that this is an oblique lattice with a two-point basis. 
I would say that the basis vectors are v1 is equal to the zero vector, and v2 is, let's say, k over 3 x hat plus 0 y. Okay, where a is the, the distance between two points along the x axis. Okay, another very useful concept is called a primitive cell. So the primitive cell is the volume of space that will fill all space when translated through all primitive vectors, or all lattice vectors, rather. So one convenient definition of the primitive cell is the set of points R equals x1, a1 plus x2, a2 plus x3, a3, where the xi are confined to be between zero and one. And of course the AI are the primitive lattice vectors. Um, if we go back to our oblique lattice, if I, let's say, consider these my primitive lattice vectors, using this definition of the primitive cell, I would have this volume of space. And it's not so hard to imagine that if I translate this volume of space by any lattice vector, I can completely cover all the space. All right. Um, if I translate this primitive cell over here, you can see that it contains exactly one lattice point. So uh, every primitive cell contains just one lattice point. Now, there's a nicer definition of the primitive cell than what we've written down here. That's called the wigner seitz primitive cell. So the wigner seitz primitive cell is something that more fully represents the symmetries of the underlying lattice. Um, it is the region of space containing all points closer to the enclosed lattice point than any other lattice point. So what does the, the wigner seitz primitive cell look like? Well, let's again draw our oblique lattice. And let's draw the wigner seitz cell around this point here. Uh, the way that we can draw it is by drawing lines through all of the neighboring lattice points. And uh, then we draw the perpendicular bisectors of these lines. And the 
Wigner-Seitz primitive cell is uh, the set of points that you can access by not crossing any of these, uh, these lines that bisect the nearest neighbor lines. So this in here, we would say is the, the Wigner-Seitz primitive cell of, of the oblique lattice. And you can see that it has uh, perhaps a somewhat nicer and more intriguing shape than the primitive cell uh, we wrote down before. So the wigner sites primitive cell is something that will come back again and again to haunt you in this course. So it's worth remembering uh, what it is. Uh, it will come back in many different guises and forms um, throughout the rest of the class.